well, these are the subjects that we uh, touch upon. In the, you know, uh, we we had sex, but actually there are more environmental, uh, urban environmental issues, more than more, more, much more than these six topics. But they are interrelated. So it's like you know, we we didn't miss out anything in the sense that you know, even when we are talking about uh, air quality and water uh, pollution, we have to say something about energy use. Um, and similarly, you know, these are all connected to climate change issues. So, you know, um, um, without any sequence, we, we look into uh, air quality issues, water pollution problems, food supply and food securities issues in LA and China and Hong Kong. We talk about, you know, something slightly different in terms of urban planning, transportation planning, the planning of space for people and the use of space in those cities. Um, and last but not least, um, uh, the connection between LA and Hong Kong and Chinese, China, Chinese cities, you know, we, we have to talk a little bit about the goods movement, the trade, and the port activities and the ships, you know, connecting these places. And that's what I'm going to start with now. But this is, this is the approach that we've taken. And, you know, um, we, we didn't start together, but, you know, uh, as I said, you know, these are the similarities that we found in our first conversation. So while in LA, you know, because of the port issues and the impact to the neighborhood uh, areas close to the ports, um, and then you know how the community are being empowered uh, by you know uh, researchers and lawyers, um, and trying to you know seek different means to fight the authority and try to push for tighter regulation uh, for port activities and ship activities. Um, well, in Hong Kong, we started with research when it comes to similar problems. Um, and, but then we, we found that you know, scientific research and engagement, whether it's with the community or with the business sector, are really important component in what, in what we call the action research framework. Um, and with these important components and parts, we are then you know, being able to move forward with uh, policy recommendations and try to intervene uh, existing policy and try to you know, drive the government or the authorities to do better and to do more. So now I, I will start with a, a story uh, from Hong Kong. You know, I've been engaged with what we call the um, Ship Emissions Control and Management, uh, well, not the project, but it's like an initiative and a series of research and, and engagement activities. Um, I, I've started that you know, since 2006. So it's been more than 10 years um, of work. Um, but you know, it is really um, rewarding, and we learn a, a lot from that process. Um, and I think we started because, number one, as you know, Hong Kong is a major seaport in the world. Uh, we handle a lot of container boxes. Actually, for more than 10 years, I think back in the 80s and 90s, uh, Hong Kong was the number one container port in the world in terms of throughputs every year. Okay. Now, we've been overtaken by first by Singapore and then by Shanghai. Shanghai is now the leading container port in the world, um, followed by Singapore and then uh, Shenzhen, and then uh, there's another port cluster yeah, near Shanghai. Um, and then Hong Kong is now number five. It's the fifth uh, biggest in the world. In terms of ranking, you know, we're dropping. Um, in terms of environmental impact from the ports and the ships, actually it's growing because of the growing trade and because the ships are getting bigger. Um, and they are staying you know, at the port for a longer period of time because they have to handle and try to ship all those boxes uh, between you know, the ships and, and the shore side. Um, So why, why are we concerned about ship emissions? Uh, first of all, I think you know, we need to know, and we, 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 we knew that because we've done some research. Um, they are using bunker fuel, and these are the, the dirtiest fuel that you, you could imagine. Uh, we're talking about high sulfur content, up to 4.5%. Uh, to give you a sense you know, for, for your car, you are using 0.005% or even better uh, type of fuel. Uh, so we're talking about a huge difference in terms of impurity with the bunker fuel. Um, and after burning, you know, there will be a lot of pollutants coming out from the combustion process. Secondly, you know, we, uh, through a lot of you know, uh, research um, that's been done in the past 10 to 15 years, we now understand that PM2.5, the smoke particulate, and the emission of PM2.5 has a lot to do with um, premature death, <coughs> and other hospitalization because of the pollution affecting human health. And this diagram basically shows you the locations around the world where you have the highest 
connection or correlations between PM 2.5 emission and uh, the highest mortality rate. Okay, but then uh, this map actually can also be used to show you where are the major port areas in the world. So we realize that there is a strong connection and correlation between PM 2.5 emission, high mortality rate, and port activities. When you look at this map, the, the darkest color, the red and the brown, those are the key port clusters in the world. So you can see, you know, there's a cluster in Europe with the port of Rotterdam and London and the neighbor, neighboring ports. And of course, I mean, China and, and Asia in, in general are important in terms of port activity. So along the Chinese coastline, you can find a lot of red and brown dots. And also Singapore further down, you know, in the Southeast Asian region. So that's the second reason why we are concerned, because we see a clear connection between air pollution, health, and port activities. And moving back or zooming back into Hong Kong, our local context, Hong Kong is a very small city. Uh, I'm sure most of you have been to Hong Kong, so you know we, we are really small, but very populated. Um, our port facilities, our containment ter contain terminal, are actually located very close to the population center. Um, we're talking about maybe a two to three kilometers distance between the port facilities, the cranes, and the residential blocks, where more than you know, probably two million or even three million people live and work. So now, moving from the filthy field and then the connection with health, and then the local context, how close we are actually with the ships on a daily basis. We feel that you know we need to do something. So back in 2006, we started to do some research. Now the first thing we learned from those research was actually around the world there are regulations, either it's by the International Maritime Organization at the very international level, governing the type of fuel that can be used by ocean going or sea going vessels. But then at the local level, you know, in port areas like Los Angeles and Long Beach. They have their own local regulations or requirements. So we know at that time, okay, um, actually in California are quite ahead in terms of you know all these regulations. They are already asking vessels to use, use cleaner fuel. They are also asking them to um, slow down their speed in a, at a in a voluntary basis because low speed actually will reduce your emission because you're burning actually fewer fuel. Um, and we also know that in Europe they are also taking some serious steps to try to control ship emissions. But there's nothing in Asia. There's nothing in Asia at that time, 10 years ago. Okay, so, you know, after doing these preliminary research, we know that there are solutions out there. We know that actually some port cities and regions are already taking it very seriously to try to control ship emissions. But then in the Asian continent and in Hong Kong in particular, there's no regulation. And because there's no regulation, the shipping lines, they use the cheapest fuel, which is bunker fuel that I just told you. And that's the, the worst type of fuel that can be used. And that's why we've got air pollution problem coming from ships. Now, after understanding the global picture and understanding a little bit about you know, what can be done in terms of control, uh, from examples from LA and Long Beach and from Europe, we done another piece of research, that is the baseline study about the extent of ship emissions in Hong Kong. Um, so we, we've conducted a very you know, um, high resolution and detailed emission inventory study. Um, and the findings are very useful in terms of formulating the most effective solutions to control ship emissions in Hong Kong. So we found out container vessels actually contributed most to air pollution coming from ships in Hong Kong, more than 80% of most of the air pollutants are coming from container vessels. So that's uh, fact number one. Fact number two, 40% or more of the emissions are produced at the container terminal area, at the berthing location. So that's the second fact that we've collected through the research. There are actually more, but these two are enough for me to demonstrate that we know in a spatial sense the emission hotspots related to ships are actually in, right in the middle, the red color, that's the container terminal area. Okay, but then of course you can also see the, the orange color, that's the main fairway leading into the port in Hong Kong. Those are also 
uh, not pollution hotspot, but maybe pollution uh, channel. Okay, so, so these are the areas that we need to deal with, but the red dots are the most concerned part of Hong Kong that's mostly affected by shed emissions. Now with that, we've started an engagement process. So, you know, the, the first part was about science. So we want to use science, we really want to rely on research to tell us what are the problems in terms of material, in terms of spatial distribution, and then with those information, it kind of tells us what should be the solution. And then with those knowledge, we went to talk to the industry, the shipping industry. Guess what, who, who, who we start the conversation with? Of course, is the container shipping lines. In Hong Kong, we have the Hong Kong Ship Owners Association. We also have the Hong Kong Liners Shipping Association. And for the Liners Shipping Associations, they represent the container lines. So more than 40 members, they are the most prominent and global players in terms of container shipping, um, like Merce Line, OCL, APL, um, Hamburg Sud, and a number of you know, European lines, so on and so forth. They are all represented by this association. So we went to talk to the association, and we showed them the, the research. We showed them um, the figures that actually container ships are contributing most to air pollution in Hong Kong from the shipping sector. Now, at the beginning, you would imagine they did not. Um, have you considered power plants or real transportation? Is I sure it's us. Um, but then, because we've done a very detailed analysis, actually we've calculated or estimated emissions coming from each ship coming into Hong Kong. So I think with that methodology and level of details, at the end of the day, they cannot deny because we show them all the numbers. So that's the first thing. So they thought, okay, maybe that's our responsibility. But then, oh, it's, it's difficult to find lots of a few. Um, even though we believe, you know, because emissions are happening at the birthing location, at the container terminal, the easiest thing, the lowest hanging fruit, they actually to ask them to switch to low sulfur fuel when they are operating at the container terminal area. But they said, oh, it's, it's difficult. We, we can't source low sulfur fuel uh, in the world. But of course, we've done our homework. We know in LA and Long Beach, they're already using low sulfur fuel because you have regulation, right? So we tell them, you know, we know you are already doing that in LA and Long Beach because of the Clean Action Plan, and because of the local regulation in California, um, and also you are going to do it in Europe because they also have regulation. So can you do it in Asia? Can you do it in Hong Kong? Now, because of that conversation that we have started with the container shipping companies, um, and beginning to having that trust, because at the beginning they were skeptical, they had no idea about you know, where we are coming from, what we want to achieve. But at the end of the day, we explained to them that we really want to you know, bring down the emission from ships. And we consider you, the shipping trade, as a partner. We really want to work with you as part of the solution, rather than pointing fingers to you. So they accepted that this is the global trend, uh, yet to be in Asia, but will be coming. And because of that, they want to be a champion, they want to be a front runner, they want to be at the table when we started to talk about regulation in Hong Kong. Uh, and I think they are really smart, okay. But playing to, you know, to that, you know, we really try to bring them together. Uh, and, and with their support, we come up with a voluntary action called the Fair Wind Shutter. Now, this is the message coming from the industry. Okay, they said, we can do it on a voluntary basis, but it cannot remain the voluntary on a voluntary basis for too long. Because it will be unfair to them, because they are paying extra to use low sulfur fuel, but their competitors were not doing that. Because there's no regulation, so some of them choose not to. So they want a level playing field. Now in order to get a level playing, playing field, they want us to work with them and to lobby the government to regulate them, to mandate them with the use of low sulfur fuel in Hong Kong. And beyond that, they also want to have unified regulation, not just in Hong Kong, but hopefully in the future within the same region now, because if Hong Kong is quite close to the Pearl River Delta, actually Hong Kong is part of the Pearl River Delta region. And we are so close to the port of Shenzhen uh, and the port of Guangzhou, and they are all major ports in, in, in the region. But it's just like next door. If Hong Kong has tightened their regulation, whereas Shenzhen and Guangzhou remain you know, unchanged, 
there are worries that, especially from the government's point of view, that some of the trade might move on to Shenzhen and Guangzhou, and it will hurt Hong Kong. So the shipping trade, you know, they, they are far-sighted, and they thought, you know, we don't want to have that kind of trouble with the government. Uh, we will stay in Hong Kong, but you know, we also want to bring the government on board to make sure that everyone is on the same page, and then we'll move forward together with regulation first in Hong Kong and then in the region, in the Peru Delta. Okay. So they specifically ask us to make sure that the government will look at it from a regional perspective. Now this is the Fairwinds Charter. Um, it started in 2011. Um, these are the small prints that I'm sure we can share with you, uh, PowerPoint. But you know, if you are interested, you know, I suggested that you should go into the details because it's very clear from the shipping lines what they really want. You know, of course, I mean, they have to pay out of their pocket to use cleaner fuel. That's uh, you know, an additional cost. But at the end, they ask for uniform regulation so that they know how to plan for their own operation in the future with a much better benchmark, with much better environmental performances. And they are willing to do that. They are willing, as I said, to be part of the solution on the basis that the government will also move with and coming up with regulation. Okay, that, that's quite unique. You know, this is actually in my career the first time you know, I engaged in an industry sector asking the government to regulate them. Okay, but with good reasons. Okay, but we, we, we've never known that this is the kind of thing they want if we don't start a conversation with them. So in that process, actually, we learned a lot in terms of how to be transparent and open and try to share our views, understand their concerns, and they understand our concern, and then try to work out a solution. And, th and that, I think that's really important. So with the Fairwind Charter you know, and showing goodwill from the shipping sector, the government responded positively. First, they provided some financial assistance to those who switch. So the government, at the beginning, they were not at the table, they didn't provide anything. But after a year of the Fairwind Charter, they chipped in with some financial support as the form of a subsidy to those who switch. Secondly, at the policy level, the government announced they are considering regulation. So that's a direct response to what's been asked uh, from the industry. And of course, the industry are very happy because of that. And after consultation, um, we eventually have the regulation starting from 1st of July 2015. And that's the uh, that makes Hong Kong actually the first port city in Asia to have regulations on ship emissions. Now, um, being the first is important, it's nice, it's good, but then I think more importantly, there will be significant emission reduction straight away because of the use of cleaner fuel. Um, when you look at you know, SO2 emission in total in Hong Kong, there will be a 12% a drop. Uh, for PM, there will be a 6% drop uh, territory-wide. At the container <coughs> terminal area, because of the use of cleaner fuel, there will be over 80% reduction of SO2 and PM, just because of the switching of fuel. Okay, because I explained to you, instead of using bunker fuel, they are now using low sulfur distillate, and there's a huge difference in terms of the fuel sulfur content. Um, so, I think this is my last slide for Hong Kong. What we've learned, as I said, being honest, transparent, and trying to work together. Um, and the voluntary action could only take you that far. You really need to have mandates to have tighter environmental control. Um, but then in that process, we've developed a lot of trust between different groups. And then after bringing uh, the government uh, to the table, the shipping sector also developed a very strong uh, trustworthy relationship with the government, which is great because after having this regulation, they are now in constant conversation about how to improve, how to do more than what they are now being asked to do, and you know how to make sure that Hong Kong's experience also will be translated into policy change in some of the Chinese ports. So that's my next part, which will be brief. That's about you know an update in China. Now, with what's happened in Hong Kong with the regulation and control of ship emissions, China actually started late, I have to say, because uh, when we were starting the research and engagement back in 2006 to 2011, China were too busy dealing with other pollution issues. And when it comes to air pollution, at that time, they focused on their power plants. Um, and they focused, I think, at the beginning uh, on SO2 and then PM. Um, but of course, ship emissions actually also involve NOx and other pollutants. 
So, you know, basically ship emissions is not under their radar at that time. Okay. They started to look into ship emissions when Hong Kong started the Fairwind Charter. So they thought, oh, maybe that's something interesting that we, we should keep an eye on. And after the success of the Fairwind Charter, which is a voluntary action, and then with the regulation, they saw a way to actually how to control quite effectively ship emissions. So they followed the Hong Kong model and starting with Shenzhen. Shenzhen has been a very aggressive uh, city when it comes to environmental uh, protection and improvement. So they set very high standards and targets for the city to, to achieve. And they are the first you know, uh, Chinese port cities to make solid commitment to cut ship emissions and port emissions. So I think they started with uh, the provision of some financial support as well. But in terms of policy, they are also trying to do something similar to what we have in Hong Kong as a fairway charter uh, supported by regulation. Now, what happened, not just in Shenzhen, but in other Chinese port is um, in 2015, the Ministry of Transportation announced that China is going to implement what they call domestic emission control areas in the three most important uh, areas for port activities and trade. The first is the Pearl River Delta region, the second is the Yangtze River Delta region, including Shanghai and Nanjing, and the third is uh, the Bohai Sea region, which is further to the north, uh, near uh, Beijing and Tianjin. Okay. So in these three major port areas, there will be tighter control, there will be tighter requirement in terms of the type of fuel that can be used by ocean-going vessels. And they, they are going to do it progressively, starting with the core ports or the key ports in those areas, and then followed by all the ports uh, the next year. And then in 2019, all the vessels entering a demarcated emission control area along the Chinese coastline in those three regions will have to use 0.5% of the fuel even when they are in movement, even when they are underway. So it's not just about at birth switching. So in Hong Kong, we talk about you know, once you park your ship, once you are secured, you have to switch to cleaner fuel. But in China, with this plan, actually when you enter the zone, just like in Europe and also in the American Inca emission control area, you have to switch even when you are quite you know, uh, far away from the coastline. But then, of course, there will be a lot more environmental benefits uh, coming with that kind of requirements. Why we, sh we should be concerned about China and Chinese ports? Because seven of the top ten uh, container ports in the world are actually in China. Okay, um, and I think you know if Hong Kong, if LA and Long Beach were concerned at that time about your port pollution and ship pollutions. In Hong Kong, you know, more than ten years ago, we started to worry about our own backyard. You know. Then thinking about the scale of port activities in China and the way they expand the ports and the number of ships coming to their ports, everyone has to be worried because it's like a huge emission hotspots along the Chinese coastline. Um, now, other than port directly related to ship activities, there are other measures that's been put forward by the Chinese government uh, also related to port activities. For example, you know, in uh, this year, 2017, there's a ban on the diesel trucks going into the port area, and also you know for those transporting coal um, from the port and to the port area. Now, uh, for the um, vehicles operating in the port area, it's actually um, in the port of Shenzhen and in Shanghai, they have already demo they have already tried to use uh, new energy to power those vehicles. So they are trial schemes um, to use LNG liquefied natural gas as the main fuel for those vehicles working within the port region. And, um, and I think they, they are also electrified vehicles in, in China working in those you know, port areas, which will definitely help to bring down the emissions coming from those uh, you know, activities. Um, I think that's the last slide uh, with me. Um, so I think my, my concluding message is, you know, we learn from Hong Kong, uh, the experience that we have in Hong Kong, that you know, when you come with environmental issues like what we are in, encountering in Hong Kong, you know, you might not be able to, to find a solution just looking, you know, from where you are. You know, we uh, look afar and you know think about LA and Long Beach and California, which has been in the forefront of uh, environmental law and regulations. And so we we feel that that kind of approach might you know actually suit our needs in Hong Kong. 
And that's what we've done with the family charter, working with the business sector, and then pushing government to, to change their policy and have regulation. Whereas in China, they are also you know, looking you know, into what's happening around the world. I understand that I was part of that process as well. You know, US EPA are working very closely with the MEP, the Ministry of Environmental Protection in China, and they have regular contact and you know, study tour. Uh, sometimes they go to China together to share experience. Sometimes they bring people from China to US cities, like in LA, they've um, you know, uh, taken care of and, and uh, a number of delegations from China looking into shore side power, looking into different emission control methodologies and, 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 and measures. And, and, and I think that will continue. I think that will continue. But you know, that's, that's the, that's the you know, two way process where that we treasure and that we found really fascinating. And I think Hong Kong benefits a lot from that process as well, being in the, right in the middle of you know the, the connection between China, China and the U.S. So you know, I really hope that that you know kind of role for Hong Kong as a facilitator uh, will, will continue. Now let me now hand over to Bob to talk about L.A., uh, where everything started. More than Before there ago. was Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> there was Los Angeles. So uh, I'll continue the story about ports and ships and and for LA especially uh, the, the transportation mode out of the ports and to the ports, which are primarily truck and ram. Um, so just a little context, LA is not on the top 10 globally, but it is by far the largest the LA Long Beach port complex, the San Pedro port complex, is by far the largest in the United States. And 40% of all the goods that come in um, to uh, uh, primarily from places like China and Hong Kong uh, go through those ports. That um, it's also upgraded its, uh, to to handle some of the largest sh um, container ships that are have been rapidly increasing over time, in fact, creating uh, a capacity overcapacity problem in the process. And you don't have other port areas in the United States up to now that have been able to handle the, the large ships. And uh, there's a side story about the Panama Canal that I won't get into that relates to the south and uh, uh, east, east coast ports. Um, and they're trying to expand, but LA is not at first. So it, it really uh, changes the dynamic. Um, and LA has expanded from the mid-'80s. It expanded enormously to meet that um, uh, the, the, the change in global trade patterns. You know, China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001. That was part of that process of uh, really scaling up what was happening in LA, in Long Beach, and the US as well. So the process in LA was very different. Um, the, uh, what you had was a lot of the initial attention on what the expansion of the ports represented came from community organizations, community-based organizations at the port, but also along the, the supply chain routes, if you will, the, the intermodal yards, the truck routes, the warehouses, which are called inland ports, that are at the eastern edge of the region in, in San, Bernardino, San Bernardino area. Um, that's where you had um, enormous environmental impacts. And actually, the Air District um, did began to do um, its own set of inventories uh, that identified uh, toxic hotspots. And they were along the goods movement uh, um, line that started with the port and went to, to the warehouses. And out of that process, community organizations began to mobilize, uh, saying, you know, our asthma rates are higher. There are other health impacts that we uh, uh, can identify. They work with researchers from the University of Southern California. Occidental um, became involved, really, as kind of the policy arm of, you know, how do you translate uh, the recognition of some of these impacts into a policy framework? Uh, also, um, some of the environmental law uh, groups got involved because uh, the, the shippers were not necessarily initially uh, uh, welcoming the research and the community action, 
uh, but even more importantly, the port itself and um, um, some of the, uh, the recipients of the goods, uh, the, the, some of the big box stores uh, that were receiving them were also resistant for any change taking place of this port expansion uh, process that was, was happening. And so uh, a framework was established to measure and identify and highlight uh, what uh, those impacts were along the goods movement communities. And a network was established called the Trade, Health, and Environment uh, Impact Project, the, um, the Impact Project. Um, and that uh, morphed into a network that was established in 2007 and then in and solidified in 2010 called the Moving Forward Network. We actually, Simon and I just came from a, a conference uh, this uh, few weeks ago, uh, which was the continuation of this process, the national and then global uh, connected uh, Moving Forward Network process. And just as a side note, one of the keynote speakers was Christine Lowe, who was the founder of Civic Exchange and went into government, and that clean air plan in Hong Kong that Simon talked about has, uh, to a great extent, her signature on it. Um, she's now actually uh, bi-national, and she's coming to LA uh, more uh, than she has in the past, so we'll see more of Christine in the US. Um, so out of that, uh, we began to see some policy change. The legal action, um, some of the uh, uh, the push to get the, sh the shipping companies, including those from China, uh, to address these problems um, and to follow on some of the very initial actions by the port to reduce emissions, particularly in terms of fuel source, but also in terms of port operations themselves, uh, taking the containers off the vessel and loading them onto the trucks and rail. And um, out of that came a, uh, the Clean Air Action Plan in 2006. A really groundbreaking change uh, that uh, had a, a series of regulations at Portside um, uh, in uh, putting in place um, uh, both the issues around fuel emissions, but also in terms of looking at alternative strategies like uh, um, using um, uh, electrification as a strategy in terms of uh, the uh, docking issues where ships were coming into the port. And trucks were a major issue. So there was a parallel initiative to shift some of the diesel fuel that was used by the trucks, they were highly polluting, to new uh, either low um, emission diesel trucks or ultimately to alternative technology, like LNG initially, but um, subsequently thinking about how to move towards a zero emission uh, future in terms of port and truck and rail operations. And a new commitment has been made in terms of the up upgrade of the Cleaner Action Plan um, to set targets for zero emission. Tra transitions. Um, so where Hong Kong and China are moving to low emission fuels, LA and Long Beach are pushing the envelope to move towards the zero emission future. China has moved along that path in terms of some of its vehicles um, and uh, given the rapidity in which China can move, we might see a zero emission future at the ports of China as well. So, uh, LA really launched the process. It was a process that came from below. It got translated into policy. Um, the exchange that Sam talked about between um, environmental regulators in the state of California, um, in Southern California, the South Coast Air Quality Management District, um, and US EPA with their counterparts uh, in Hong Kong and China has been fruitful. Uh, but Will that continue? So what we thought we would do is uh, talk about US and China and environmental uh, policy 
shifts that are taking place as we talk. Um, we actually gave a talk in Hong Kong at the Foreign Correspondence Club, and they wanted us to frame, we also talked to them about doing this type of presentation, they really wanted us to frame it as, who's better, China or the U.S.? And um, so if you want to ask us about that, we'll tell you what the answer was there. We'll translate that into the answer here. So we decided to talk about it as we, as uh, these changes are happening as we talk. Uh, but let's put in context in terms of environmental policy before the 2016 election. Um, you, you had a, a long history around air quality um, that uh, was, uh, goes back to uh, the 1970 Clean Air Act, which it itself was part of a process that predated it, uh, led by Los Angeles and California. Uh, wanting to ensure a, a range of, of targeted goals for reducing uh, what were called the criteria pollutants, um, which included PM, um, but also um, sulfur dioxide, NOx, et cetera, ozone. And, um, but in the, in, the, in the 40 years plus, 45 years since the passage of the Clean Air Act, uh, you've had kind of a fits and start um, in extending um, at the national level the implementation uh, and the expansion of regulation uh, in the air quality area. But in the last couple of years, you've, um, before the 2016 election, you really saw an expansion of that. You had a, a series of new regulations that were put in place, um, everything from uh, methane emissions, the uh, average fuel efficiencies of, of vehicles that, uh, that were fleet-wide, um, the, uh, the shift around um, uh, energy um, alternatives uh, that have air quality implications. That really, that scaling up really only took place in a substantial way in 2014, 2015, and 2016. Similarly, around food and agricultural policy, um, you've had really the development of a, 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 a mature uh, industrially organized food system that has substantial environmental impacts uh, uh, and uh, a focus also on how that food system looks outward globally rather than uh, kind of a place-based food system. And um, a number of the policies that were put in place at USDA, as well as with um, the environmental side from the Environmental Protection Agency, tended to be relatively weak, if non-existent. That also began to change, um, in, uh, particularly in, um, in the second term of the Obama administration. Uh, energy, if you remember the debates uh, in the 2012 election, um, the Republican candidate was saying, you're anti-fossil fuel, you're anti-coal. And uh, the Obama response to that was, well, we, we, we need green energy. We need to scale up uh, wind and solar. But we're in favor of all the above. Um, so it, it didn't really take on the idea that there had to be a major shift in terms of fossil fuel production. Uh, that changed uh, about three years ago. Um, both the scaling up of the green energy targets, uh, but uh, beginning to put in place some significant uh, both policies and restrictions on fossil fuel development. And then finally, on climate, there's a shift that went on for, uh, between uh, Copenhagen in 2009 and Paris in 2015 in terms of the attention to climate, the discourse around climate, and then finally some direct policy changes that had climate um, implications. Um, so that was before Trump. What happened since the 2016 election? 
uh, much of what's gone on with the Trump administration has really been directed at undoing uh, the regulatory changes that um, were put in place as opposed to the legislative and policy changes, which really hadn't happened. Uh, and that was part of the reason you saw a uh, real expansion of environmental policy initiatives in the 2015-2016 period. You had a, a, a hostile Congress. Uh, if you were going to move on climate, if you were going to move on air quality, if you were going to move on, on some of the water issues, on the food issues, uh, it had to be through regulatory change, executive orders, a, a number of, of things at the administrative level rather than at the, at the policy level. Um, so there's been an attempt to, uh, to make, uh, uh, undo what happened in those two years prior to 2016, mostly through, again, uh, administrative action rather than policy. You haven't seen a major environmental policy initiative in the, in the 10 months since the election uh, or since the inauguration um, for a number of reasons. But you have seen a number of executive orders, undoing prior executive orders like the CAFE standards. Uh, and, but there's been a change in the discourse. Um, you have a celebration of fossil fuels, a celebration of coal. Um, a, and you have people put in place, the science advisor of, uh, to US EPA, the head of US EPA, who spent much of his uh, uh, political life suing the Environmental Protection Agency before he became EPA Administrator, uh, Scott Pruitt, in Oklahoma. Um, and uh, you really have climate denial, which had faded uh, in, uh, in the period from, say, 2010 to 2016, the last attempt to create national legislation around climate. Um, uh, the, the discourse had changed. Uh, climate became a, uh, a topic of note with the question of how you're going to address it rather than does it exist. Well, you, you've seen a shift around that discourse. And I don't have it here. I, I have it in one of the other slides, um, the term sue the bastards. Uh, I thought maybe that I shouldn't use that term here, but this is New York. exchanging <laughs> here in New York. Uh, Sue the Bastards was a term that was used back in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, one of the organizations that came, uh, that was, uh, uh, that developed in that period, the Environmental Defense Fund, uh, which now really talks about negotiating with the bastards. And that's really <laughs> that's really right. Right. But that was uh, one of the concepts they used because litigation became an extension of environmental action. In, in the late 60s, early 70s. Well, it's reappeared. Uh, and so every effort at bringing about a reversal, uh, a major reversal on environmental policy is leading to litigation as well as community action and, uh, and policy initiatives that are taking place at the local and state level. Um, the sort of famous moment around climate took place when um, uh, uh, Trump and Pruitt had their press conference talking about the pulling out of the Paris Agreement, which has to be, of course, a process taking place. He said, you know, uh, his constituency was Pittsburgh and not Paris. I'm sure you will remember the outcome of that where the mayor of Pittsburgh and the mayor of power, Paris said, we're in. We're not in. Uh, and uh, we are going to do everything we can to ensure that the pa Paris Agreement Accords are upheld in terms of our actions. Of course, California, New York, and many other places are signing in and thinking about how that translates directly. So you've had change um, from rhetoric, administrative action, and resistance all happening in the period um, since the 2016 election. So what's happened in China? Um, well, you, you know, at Copenhagen, uh, the Chinese were reluctant players. Um, they uh, uh, weren't climate deniers, but they weren't climate actors, um, or at least to the level uh, which uh, they, uh, the change has taken place when Paris uh, occurred. 
And that, there are a number of reasons for that shift uh, happening. Um, amongst other things, uh, real pressure from below, not organized pressure from below, but discontent about some of the uh, uh, health and um, uh, kind of daily life experiences when you have substantial air and water and uh, um, um, environmental impacts that uh, influence uh, people's daily lives. And, uh, and, and at the uh, national and global level, the, uh, the notion that you need really to act on climate has uh, become far more prominent in China. And it's translated into a, a series of um, major initiatives uh, that have been developed at the, the central government level. Um, also, uh, new targets set. Uh, the idea that coal, which 70% of the, the fuel source um, uh, in energy generation is coal, how do you start reducing that? Even though much of your energy infrastructure is coal based. So you've started to see a very modest reduction in terms of coal production in China that's directly related to some of the environmental questions associated with that production. You haven't necessarily seen a wholesale reduction in terms of coal use because there's still an active um, uh, import uh, of coal that's coming into the country. Um, and uh, in terms of those national policies, uh, the challenge remains how is that going to be really implemented at the uh, um, level of where those uh, impacts are being um, felt. And that includes what are the provincial governments going to do? What are the industry players going to do? How are you going to really reorient a, uh, a set of policies that places, for example, automobile, the automobile industry as a priority industry, or where you have relationships between the petrochemical plant in a region that is highly polluting um, and some of the government officials that are connected to the petrochemical plant um, in, in a particular province. And yet you have uh, policies being developed at the central government level that really attempts to begin to dis, uh, uh, connect those links. Um, and so you've had uneven implementation to the point where now the central government is now talking about, well, what do we do at the level of implementation as well as policy development? And, um, I haven't seen the proceedings of the 19th Congress, but I think that's going to be a major issue uh, in the environmental area. There'll be new environmental pronouncements but what's going to happen in terms of uh, how it's going to be implemented. Um, and so I'm going to leave with uh, my story. Um, China um, about bicycles. It's a, uh, for a number of reasons, uh, bicycles have been important to us in LA in terms of the work we've done. We had an event in 2003 uh, where we closed down the freeway uh, between Pasadena and downtown LA so people could ride their bikes and walk on the freeway. We actually didn't do a sit-in on the freeway to close it down. We had a two-year process of dealing with California Highway Patrol and the California Department of Transportation and the cities of South Pasadena, Pasadena, and Los Angeles to say you can't actually close the freeway uh, and have people do this activity of, of riding their bikes and walking on the freeway, um, albeit for four hours. Uh, uh, and they finally agreed because they had some policymakers thinking that would be a cool event. But that was a part of the initiative in Los Angeles was to change the way one thought about can you begin to construct alternative ways of um, transportation, alternative modes, um, and that discussion has continued. Well, in China uh, and in Hong Kong, Hong Kong has a, a you know, truly marvelous rail system. 90% of all 
uh, uh, uses of transit are rail-based or through the MTR system. China has an expanding rail system, but it also has scaled up the use of automobiles. Bikes are an interesting story in their own right in China. Um, bikes were really relatively non-existent before 1949. Um, that changed dramatically, um, partly because of the organization of where people worked and where they lived, the Gone Way. Um, really scaled up, made uh, a lot of sense. There was an uh, efficiency of using bikes for local transport. And that's where the, the concept of the bicycle kingdom came into play in that period, in the, from the late 40s through, through the 70s and 80s. When the reform period developed, um, including the, the shift to the urbanization shift, um, uh, that was, was happening and the development uh, strategies. Bikes were considered kind of the old scenario of tra around transport. And you even had some cities undoing the kind of bike infrastructure that had been established um, in, in uh, as late as the 80s and early 90s. Um, and uh, I have a wonderful, we, had, we came across a wonderful quote uh, by the delegation to Copenhagen asking about bikes and saying, you know, we're not, you know, we're not the bicycle we, You know, we, we're, we're putting into place a modern contemporary transportation system and bikes are really at best secondary to that notion. Well, that started to change in the last few years and uh, one of the forms it took was bike share. Um, China embraced that. It happened a little bit late in the game, uh, but it was a it, it mimicked some of the bike share programs that were uh, first developed in uh, in Paris and came to the United States, uh, where you had docking stations, you put the bikes in, grew very rapidly in China, uh, but it wasn't at the, the bicycle kingdom scale. Well, we were in um, uh, Shanghai. Um, and Beijing just a month ago. Uh, for me, I had only been in, uh, in those cities just a few years before. And it was a, I, I, I don't know if any of you have been back in the, in the last uh, 12 months, but uh, you have this dockless bike revolution that's taking place. It's a phenomenal shift. Um, uh, hundreds of thousands of bikes, these, this colored bike revolution that has taken place, um, started by the former head of Uber, um, Shanghai, and um, uh, a Peking University student, uh, the two major companies. And some of the largest invest investors decided that this was uh, because of the technologies that were used in terms of making it occur and the use of uh, um, cell technology to unlock the bikes and where the bikes are located, the QR system, um, we're interested in it partly as potentially as a, um, a, a huge data source that could also be used for other purposes. Similar to when you think about uh, uh, the the, the Uber systems, so, so, and so uh, 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 you know, substantial capital was invested from these, you know, young people coming up with this bright idea uh, that not only scaled it up at the, this massive level, but also created a, a cost incentive, uh, 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 our equivalent of fifteen cents a half an hour in the U.S. Uh, one yuan for half hour in, in China, really created this massive influx of these bikes. A lot of problems associated with it, but uh, when we gave our talks in, in Shanghai and Beijing, every talk we went to, even to the foreign correspondents, no, not the foreign correspondents, but the, I'm trying to think what would be an equivalent. Uh, but, um, anyway, every talk we, we went to, we, we asked the question, how many of you use these colored dockless shared bikes. 
Literally, everybody raised their hand. Wow. Literally, everybody raised their hand. Um, and, and you saw it in, in the streets. So they want to bring it to the United States now. Um, and uh, they have succeeded with a few cities at a very modest scale. Seattle uh, uh, eliminated its, its own docked bike share program. It, it wasn't working. But um, one of the companies, a couple of the companies, actually, they, you now have kind of copycat US companies that are moving along the same lines. Uh, New York, there's been resistance. LA, there's a little exploration. They're not sure where it's going to happen. Washington, DC has embraced it. Um, uh, C is complementary to um, the DC bike share program. Um, so it's, it's being, uh, it's entering into the dialogue about transportation in the U.S. with this new kind of technological innovation that's been scaled up uh, enormously in China. And I'll end with this um, photo from Worcester, Massachusetts. We will all be in Massachusetts uh, um, next week. Uh, where the city manager and the head of the chamber are riding their dockless bikes. They have no bike share program, and they thought for a number of reasons this would make sense in Worcester, Massachusetts. So uh, you, you see this uh, exchange of ideas, of initiatives, uh, with the opportunity for thinking about transportation different things. One element, it makes a lot of sense in terms of short distance, small areas. Um, uh, it doesn't take on the larger issue of moving from a fossil fuel dependent um, car centric transportation system, uh, but it begins part of that dialogue. So our conclusion, we see change happening. We see a lot of resistance to change, uh, but it happens, it takes on many forms. Um, it's sometimes unexpected. Uh, it has different pressure points. Uh, it doesn't necessarily address some of the structural issues that uh, we are in fossil fuel economies in the US and in China. And Hong Kong is um, seeing, even with its marvelous thinking about transportation, rail system and the increase in the use of cars and the transportation planning is still focused significantly on, on cars being part of the transport mode and how do you make streets more efficient for cars and vehicles. So those are the kinds of challenges that we see and part of the message of the book is that change is happening. There are opportunities. There are different ways in which change is happening. And um, the exchange of both ideas and policies, and ultimately uh, how systems change, is really the next stage of how we're going to see really major environmental shifts, uh, whether it's global or local. And so we'll end with that. Thank you. That was really wonderful. We have about 10 minutes for questions. Sorry, so, long. so please <laughs> keep your questions concise. And let's go. Frank, please introduce yourself. <coughs> Frank Kale. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the question uh, as between regulation and best practices as ways of motivating the users um, to make improvements. So specifically, if you look at Pro River Delta, Yangtze River Delta, Bohai, uh, are all of them following the same regulation? Is each doing it on its own? And what are they looking to uh, to make any changes, or what are they resisting? Is there a, is there a leader? I'm guessing that uh, uh, Long Beach and, and uh, LA are leaders in the United States in terms of innovation. How about in China? Well, I think um, the three regions that you just mentioned, they are in a way collaborating and coordinating in terms of the type of standards and requirements that would happen. Because uh, from the shipping lines perspective, they don't want to deal with different requirements in different port clusters. So that's been made very clear from day one um, in Hong Kong. 
and, and the message has been put forward also to the mainland uh, ports that you know we have to have uniform standards. Whether it's tight or tight enough, that's another issue. That's up to further discussion. But at least if they're going for you know better fuel, it has to be you know just one type of fuel for the entire China's coastline, and especially in those three major port areas. Um, whether there will be resistance, definitely yes, because from the um, shipping companies' point of view, unless you put out regulations and you know make it the standard, otherwise they will still consider the cost factor. They don't want to bear the cost uh, while their competitors will get away you know, by doing less. So you know it has to come from the government, and I can see a real uh, change and shift in terms of the mentality uh, when it comes to shipping emissions control in China in the last couple of years. You know, it's been so they've, they've been so determined and committed, and it's all coming from the very top. It's coming from Ministry of Transportation. It's not coming from an indiv individual port authority or a, a mar maritime safety administration at the city level. Now, so so I think you know it's, it's a, a top-down uh, approach, uh, you know, just like what usually happened in China. It's from the very top. But among the three regions, actually, there are competition. Competition in terms of who would be the first to go for tighter regulation. So when they set like a baseline for the regulation, they are all using 0.5 percent of the fuel. The Sunjun always want to do want to use 0.1 because they want to be the first in China to use 0.1. Actually, in Hong Kong, we're talking about the same whether we should go for 0.1, and that's been a conversation that we had since we when we were negotiating for the Federal Charter. Shanghai, I think they also want to go for the same, but very likely, I would tell you. Very likely because of all these port, you know, trying to compete to do more. At the end, maybe the Ministry of Transportation will announce after some review, all three regions will call for port one. But that's because of the pressure, because of the competition between different port regions trying to do better um, uh, than than the neighbors, uh, and that's driving the whole crew moving forward together. So I think that would be nice. That would that would be nice. Um, we, I talk about competition because of tighter reg regulation and worries about you know getting the trade being shifted to another region. That conversation also happened in China, but died down very quickly because they know they have to move forward together to have better and tighter environmental standards, ports and ships. Um, and they will worry about the competition between you know uh, com uh, competing ports later. And from the examples in the U.S., like Long Beach and L.A. They're also competing, but when it comes to environmental control, they join hands and they work together. Likewise, in uh, Tacoma, Seattle, and Vancouver, even across the border, they, they're doing the same. And I think likewise in New Jersey and New York, they have similar arrangements. So I think there will be competition and there will be collaboration, but then the whole thing will move forward because of the desire to do that. Although it can also uh, be the reverse can take place. Uh, in, around, uh, in the U.S., as L.A. started to change in 2006, 2007, uh, that was the first discussions about um, expanding the Panama Canal to uh, accommodate some of the larger ships. And um, the concern was, oh, it's more expensive, we're greening the port, um, the ships are going to go to um, the Panama Canal, and there's port expansion taking place in Savannah, and taking place in, in Virginia, and taking place in, in Florida, Jacksonville. Um, they're not going to go green. Uh, they're going to have lower costs. Um, so there was, you know, that kind of back and forth, and the argument was um, really a challenge because of ultimately greening the port is going to be the the end point, both for the shippers, uh, for both the, the commuting pressure when the moving forward network, for example, was created, it um, consciously set out to go to those other port communities and did a study of why the Panama Canal opening was bogus. Um, and so there's a, the network that's coming from below on these issues. Um, and. But it works both ways. That oh, you can't green, you can't move on environment on the environmental front because it's going to make you less competitive. That that argument still comes into play. Go ahead. 
I'm just uh, you know talking Say about who the, you are, please. Oh, Helena Colenda, Loose Foundation. Uh, the coming from below and the coming from the top. Um, I'm just interested whether there's any coming from below that you've seen in, in China um, as well. Um, well, yes and no, I think. Yeah, by the way, that's the answer of yes. Uh, <laughs> is it China or is it yes? Uh, there's a reversal of goals. Well, yes or no. Well, I, I think in in um, let's let's use air quality and air pollution as an example. I think in the last five to ten years, uh, maybe five, um, local residents in major cities, in Chinese cities, I mean, they are getting more and more concerned about air pollution and the you know, the impact on. So they are demanding for more data, real-time information. They're looking around, trying to get hold of all this information to better protect themselves. So in a sense, because of their concern and uh, request coming from below, um, whether in terms of policy change, whether in terms of the provision and dissemination of information related to air quality from the government's point of view, and whether in terms of um, other services provided by maybe the business sector, you know, I'm talking about you know, small sensors as you know telling you what's the air quality in your vicinity, and maybe even the, the canned clean air that someone you know in, in China is selling, you know, as a gimmick maybe. Um, but the business sector is also engaged because of that demand, and I think to some extent that pressure from below actually helped the government to take some of the tighter regulation forward. So I would say, you know, um, the Chinese government is not worried at all, in that particular example, not worried at all about pressure coming from below because they know uh, from the government's point of view they can also use that pressure to push forward tighter regulation and work together with the city governments to come up with and hitting those air quality standards and targets. Um, so in a way, they welcome that kind of you know, uh, pressure. Well, what they don't welcome is organized mm. right. forms of the pressure, and that's that's the big difference. Yes. And when you don't have an organized form in civil society making um, not only weighing in on issues but being part of the process, um, that changes some of the dynamic. And the question of the environment is is just a, a, a really important case in point because ultimately. Uh, the pressure from below, once it becomes organized, is much more potent. And if the government is making this green transition, uh, it will ultimately want to have that form of organized uh, activity on behalf of making a shift, particularly if you're dealing with problems of implementation and accountability. Um, and, uh, but there's still, you know, as you all know, enormous resistance for that form um, to happen. You know, we did meet with, um, you know, with, with MGOs or sort of actors um, uh, who are civil society actors, if you will. And, you know, we met with uh, a representative of, of uh, Greenpeace in Beijing, for example. Or, um, uh, so it's not entirely the case that there is some organized form, but it's it's a different. Um, uh, you don't have the sue the bastards <laughs> framework that you right. have. Well, that, that you, have. Have you do have some litigation, litigation yeah. Yeah. but maybe that's the language is, is yeah, a that's different. Yeah, that's the point. No point in suing if you can't win. <laughs> But anyway, I, you know, it's it's a dynamic situation. It is changing. Um, uh, it's changing in this country. We're seeing hostility towards civil society action in this country, um, and concern that there'll be some level of um, action against organized groups. Um, you know, under the guise of whatever, of, uh, you know, that this is against the interests of the, the U.S. or their they're really environmental terrorists or whatever the language would be. I don't think that's going to go anywhere. But um, 
you know, maybe that's my uh, optimistic nature. Uh, well, let's stop on the optimistic <laughs> nature. Please join me in thanking our speakers, and the book is available for purchase right outside. <laughs>